free will. Free will, guys. So, coming out of episode Ardim, considering I've been reading this, it's only the basics on philosophy, so I'm definitely not coming in as a pro whatsoever, but coming out of episode Ardim with that final story, so we could talk about it at last. Um, whoa! The twist at the end got me right in my gut because <clears throat> I've been theorizing for a while about the different elements of Final Fantasy XV. Uh, and while my theories were never spot on, accurate, they were floating around in the ballpark figure. So, is Bahamut the villain? I did a video way back, is Bahamut the villain? Touched on some of the elements that I thought made him villainous. Uh, is Ardin really the villain or is he the hero? I've done videos on that. Were all his actions actually the only way that the Star Scourge would have got destroyed? Uh, and did he know that? And now when we come at the end, end of episode Ardin and both of those are kind of true and not true at the same time. What I really love is that Versus 13 quote. Nothing is either good or bad. Thinking makes it so. Only thinking makes it so. Really carries so much weight. And I feel like it just returned. That, that colour uh, that has been introduced or injected because of episode Ardin into the story. Into the questionable decisions. Moral decisions that all the key different characters made. I said this in the previous video, I said Somnus, Bahamut, Ardin, Noctis. And in fact, I'd even add Regis. I feel like when you look at these five characters, they all had to make an approach to a moral dilemma. Well, more than a moral dilemma. Well, yeah, a moral dilemma to a, a catastrophic event scenario problem. And that's, of course, the Star Scourge. The Star Scourge, which is the all-prevailing plot. Um, I feel like I might have focused in too much on the Star Scourge itself, like where it comes from, even though we have a little bit of a broader knowledge. There was some data logs or, or the Fastel's diaries, which gave some added answers to that. How it interacts with the environment, how it changes people, how it goes into the atmosphere and darkens the sky. But I feel like it's, it is pointless to focus too much on that because it's not really the main point. The point is the Star Scourge is the plot device and the way that these five characters handle it really has to make us question ourselves our view of morality what we would have done before we start judging these other characters so i'm gonna dive straight into it um it's gonna be great so the huge reveal at the end of episode ardin uh you know just, just to give a bit of context in case if anyone hasn't seen it or, or, or doesn't fully picture it all together we never really knew how long ardin had been around we certainly didn't know until after the game that he'd been locked away for 2,000 years. We know he'd existed that long or longer. But now we know conclusively he got betrayed by his brother. He should have been picked by the crystal. That was made even clear in episode Arden. He was the one to be picked. Uh, but Somnus betrayed his bro because he believed the Star Scourge had to be approached with a severity. So the first person I'm going to talk about is Somnus. His moral slant, his, moral slant, his, his approach with things... I'd say he's encompassed what's something called rule utilitarianism. So utilitarianism is the idea of should your actions, or whatever actions you take, be aimed towards what serves the greatest good or creates the greatest amount of good. Now you've got three different kinds. You've got negative utilitarianism, which is based on the assumption that the right action in any circumstance is the one that produces the greatest overall happiness but perhaps this puts too much stress on the happiness it's more actually the avoidance of pain and suffering so that's negative utilitarianism and we've definitely seen that philosophy come through with various villains throughout the final fantasy series uh i would say for example uh seymour is the one that 100 percent comes to mind seymour's view of the world was that pain and suffering is all around therefore if you eradicate life, you eradicate pain and suffering. That will create the overall good. That will be for the best. And that's even a, a criticism on negative utilitarianism is the destruction of all life. The best way to eliminate all suffering from the world would be to eliminate all sentient life completely. So that's a Seymour Guado kind of view. Whereas basic utilitarianism, that's more like the baseline of doing the greatest good for the greatest amount of happiness. Um, as far as you can perceive it, and that's kind of the problem. By the way, I'm, I'm paraphrasing hugely these philosophical concepts that philosophers have been debating for literally hundreds of years. So I'm, never, I'm, not, I'm not trying to weigh in anything unique or outstanding, just trying to lay out some of the, the thoughts of it, the thought patterns of it. Uh, 
But of course, utilitarianism, as it's based on, to create the most amount of happiness. Uh, how much has, does that come out? Self-sacrifice. What even is happiness? Is, is happiness even something that we should strive for? Is that just a blissful mental state? There's no more constructive or needed uh, than, say, just a neutral one. Uh, and how do you know what is creating happiness in somebody else? There's a lot of questions, and especially when you read into philosophy, and it, it, it's definitely intriguing. This is my second book on it now, and it's definitely intriguing that what seems like you're talking around in circles for the point of it, like you're talking about things that eh, most of us are obvious, you know. What we think are right and wrong is so black and white, but what is right and wrong, and who is it to certain people? And how do you allow it to lead your actions? Or to what degree it should. So this is the kind of video I want to go in with. And the reason I've put free will. Free will has been such a huge. If not I'd say one of the most pivotal. Uh, plot elements. I don't, well, I don't know if you call it a plot element. One of, the, one of the core concepts. Of Final Fantasy games. Is free will. And humanity's right. I suppose to have it. Even if having it. Creates more negative. Than it does positive. Because any god could take over with a view of how it can make the world better. Um, but And it might. But essentially, is that coming at too high a cost? Is free will more important than happiness? And the reason why I say this is because Somnus, with his rule utilitarianism, uh, the idea of rule utilitarianism is that it's a combination of act utilitarianism and something called dentological utilitarianism, which, for example, would be if you were to take over rule and you're trying to create under your rule the greatest amount of happiness well what if it was shown that torturing or putting innocent people in jail or putting people in jail regardless of whether they're innocent or not you set a very strong bold precedence about what is right or wrong even if some innocent people will get swept up in that or people who don't deserve the punishment that's being dished out uh would it still lead to the greater good? You know, if by punishing sometimes innocent people or even sometimes slightly innocent people, you know, if you really crack down the whip and that discourages uh, that, that bad event ever happening again, uh, overall that will create the most amount of happiness. People will be less inclined, theoretically, to break the law, which in turn will cut out a lot of the grey area. And I, I say this with Somnus because that is very much the approach he took. His approach to the Star Scourge was simply kill as many people as you can. Kill even those who have come close to the infection. So innocent people were getting murdered, but it was a... It was better safe than sorry kind of scenario. You know, the, the quicker we stop the spread of this, the, uh, the harsher we take the approach early on. You know, and nip it in the bud. It's the idea of, if it was your choice, would you have one generation suffer quite substantially if it meant that thousands of generations to come wouldn't? And that was really made evident in episode Ardin that that was the line that separated Ardin and Somnus. They got on well as kids, they played chess, uh, Somnus looked up to Ardin bit jealous which was also admitted during the scene and i really liked that they made somnus express his guilt and what he knew was wrong but at the same time he said to uh, ardin can you just understand can you just understand the approach i took why i took it why the gods and again i think this is i'm coming i'm coming to bahamut the bastard he said it was part of the gods as well so how much was he even influenced by what the gods was telling him and the reason why i think the star scourge is so good at being the plot device is because from what we've understood of the story is there's nothing to solve it nothing to solve it. as long as the star scourge is in humans it will start find somehow find a way to spread and we kind of have proof of that because solheim was the nation that had it before the only way that ended and the world had a few few 1500 1600 years of peace i think it was because it, it came around again through excavation this was something we didn't know that came out through episode ardin is well solheim was destroyed mostly by ifrit that more or less wiped out the scourge uh, and then it was over in the uwat island i think it was humans traveled over they found demons they brought it back it came back into circulation and now considering that mass extermination was the only way that solved it last time and while you would look at Solheim getting destroyed and there was a whole astral war around it, at the end of the day, 
did it do the greatest good? Because if Solheim had been allowed to continue, flourish, the Star Scourge could have spread and it could have totally eradicated humanity. So everything that is in the current timeline could be attributed to that act of severity back then that's created the Great Scourge now. No new nations rose up, life continued, and the fact that the Star Scourge came back round was refound. This is why I feel like Bahamut, especially with the actions he took. And what exactly was that? What action did Bahamut take? We still don't know, fully know his motives, so it's hard to categorize him as a villain or not, because what, what we have to see is that Ifrit, he wasn't trying to eradicate the Star Scourge when he destroyed Solheim, he was trying to kill man for their hubris. And that's why the Astral started, so, and Bahamut was on the other side. So we could, on one hand, see that Bahamut wanted to save mankind. He didn't want them to be destroyed, so he actually cares about the life of humanity. But then again, you could also question, is it just because he's the head of the gods? And it's through humans that he has his status. It's humans that give him his power. Um, and without them, the world would fall to darkness, and he'd, he'd rule on a cold, dark, empty throne. Just like not, just, ooh. Oh, some parallels there. Mm. Whereas Noctus was willing to sacrifice himself for it, what e extra steps could Bahamut? Now, how much of it was self-serving for him, we really don't know, because the scenario that Bahamut created, and is part of why a lot of people are now calling him a villain, and it kind of might be true, is after the Scourge was rediscovered, and you know, there's even a, a deeper question, you know, is it because it was rediscovered because mankind is becoming more industrious again? Same as what Solheim did. They became a huge technological uh, race. We saw an actual image of it. Hopefully I've found it. Uh, where their cities were very advanced. Like, they really did climb up the scale. And we could even say that that cycle is rehappening. Because they've excavated the Scourge. So humanity's technology. Their ability to travel the world. To go out drain its resources. And power themselves. Power their lives. More of a disconnect from nature. In the natural harmonious way. That's why the Star Scourge was, was found again. And we're even in, in this situation with our day-to-day -day life. We're driving the planet into the ground. You know, studies have come out and said that we're now at the point of no return. Whereas in if we went green tomorrow, we'd become too industrious. Humans' tendrils have reached too far that the destruction of the planet is more on a close to guaranteed path. And the Star Scourge, I feel, represents that where mankind grows too big, too great, too greedy, that force. Remember with the Star Scourge it's so obvious and we have to question if global warming, if the planet being destroyed was so much more obvious than it is now. I mean it's, it's obvious to most smart people but so glaringly obvious that you wouldn't be able to ignore it and would Bahamut's decision to try to reset humanity not be the correct answer it worked with solheim and now we saw he brought that option in front of ardin so bahamut knew the star scourge was back knew that there was no way to destroy it it was never going to get destroyed only way to completely eradicate it was for a king of light to come into being obviously they tried it with ardin but they tried it the wrong way that's on them kind of they corrupted ardin and no way now that Arden was corrupted, could he become the King of Light? Though he was a villain he chose to, obviously part of what Somnus did, and this is where Somnus was definitely villainous in his actions, took out Aira, started the fight in front of everybody to show the monster in Arden. Now from Somnus's point of view, he genuinely didn't believe that somebody who was infected by the Star Scourge, as Somnus knew he was, could be the King of Light. There's a question on whether he could have or not. No, before the point he snapped, because again, he should have been, but after it happened, there was no chance anymore. And Bahamut then made the decision that Ardin was one half of the coin. He was the dark bringer for the King of Light. He needed to spread the world into darkness. This was such a plot point. <laughs> oh, it was a plot twist, Arino. It really was. He said to Ardin straight up that he has to be the one who spreads as much darkness as possible, has to create fertilize the conditions for king of light to be born and if he didn't comply this is why i definitely think bahamut is villainous because if Arden didn't comply then he would spend the rest of his life undying in torment pain and agony and even the concept of who Arden is is uh, episode Arden made that so malleable because we found out that every time he infects someone he takes on 
not only sees their memories, so he actually saw all of Ifrit's memories, which is huge. It, it would have given him such a concept of humanity and time and the greater picture that far exceeded anything that Noctis in the early part of the game could have comprehended. Arden's actions were not all his own. They were part of the figments of both godhood and many suffering and pieces of humanity. But then there was also still that really integral oracle still there. That, that, that king of light, that healer. And it was really curious to see that after 2,000 years being locked up when Arden was still praying to the gods. He was aghast at the idea of infecting a god with a scourge. He still had faith. Though he wanted revenge, he himself knew that his purpose, his calling, was to save lives, not to take them. And then here comes Bahamut and says you either spend a life in torment or you can have both your vengeance and the opportunity to save mankind. And I feel like whichever version of Arden, the insane, snapped, broken, and I've got to say the, the point at which Arden turned. <laughs> Again, Darren Paul voiced that. Amazingly, that was incredible. That was the moment he snapped. And the, and the thing is, so, so Arden is such a complex character. He's a mishmash of himself. He's a mishmash of this new, vengeful, hateful version of him. But there's still that version of the healer in there. And when Bahamut gives him the option, you can have both your revenge and the only thing that will save mankind. What else was he going to do? Both of those sides appeal to Arden. And yet at the same time, they're completely against his values, his instinct. Because there's two Ardens. So... Arden either has to let the line that betrayed him kill him again. No, I think as Arden said, paraphrasing, that I have to let the son of an ill-begotten line be the one to take me out. That's a fate he has to accept. And then at the same time, it's, it's contradicting to the core value they had, which was to save lives, not take lives. <sighs> My calling is to save lives. <laughs> Just like you saved that innocent man by turning him into a demon. They're conflicting. They are conflicting. And a one is virtue theory, which is based largely on Aristotle's um, ethics theory. Uh, virtue theory is that every human should take virtuous actions. And virtues are based on what creates the most harmony in society it's very similar to like Kantian ethics which is uh, everything you do should be based on virtue where regardless of the outcome you know not telling a lie not killing you know at the end of the day even if it meant you know going back and killing Hitler would you kill Hitler utilitarianism would definitely say yes that would create the most amount of happiness um uh, it, it, definitely <laughs> uh whereas something like Kantian or virtue ethics would say no killing is wrong it's wrong regardless of the outcome so you can't do it. And the, the, the switch between Arden as a healer and as a crazed, sociopathic, vengeful lunatic, it put him square in both of those camps, kind of. Because, again, vengeance is largely driving Arden's action. The right action for Arden to take at that point is, is pretty deep. And that's why the ending, giving us the either uh, submit to Bahamut's uh, uh, suggestion, or defy, not really suggestion, uh, because this is the other huge thing that came through during that scene is Bahamut said that everything with mankind is preordained. Everything, regardless of whether they realize, all is preordained, all must play their role. That actually now makes me think during the Omen trailer very quickly because everyone always said that the French uh, actor, or I think it was the German, was the same as the voice actor for Arden. So everybody thought it was Arden because that crystal did pretty much say that everyone had to play a role. You know, as must we all will play his role and Reed just looked up and asked for forgiveness uh, so I don't know if it's Bahamut or Ardin but with Bahamut's approach you know he as a god he has the broadest view of everything he has the broadest view of what's going to happen to humanity if this star scourge continues and, and for all we know it could again completely wipe out humanity but that could be in his view of how humanity is at the moment as this industrious warring greedy far-reaching you know species that because he 
doesn't understand humanity. He feels like his manual intervention is more than an invention. He has to ordain it. He has to manually control you know, what happens. He is judge, jury, and executioner, and that's more like applied ethics. Applied ethics being more the practical application of moral considerations and his ethics that are based on real world actions and moral consequences in areas of private, public life, professions, health, technology, law, leadership, a broader view. This is the kind of ethics that would call into question if you were going to consider euthanasia for somebody, for example. Um, you know, do you know better? Do you know best? Do you know the will of another that you can manually take over and make the decision for them? You know, it could be the same as any moral value. Is it, is it ever a right to impose a moral value? Um, or decision just because you have a or, or believe you have a higher understanding of the situation and Bahamut definitely did and the fact that he said that everything is preordained blows the whole 15 story out of the water because humanity has no free will none of its own and this is why I go to the dawn of the future book the thing that I was kind of dubious about is when it said that Luna was going to return with her body, body slightly altered or change about her of some sort, we don't fully know. And that she was going to overturn the fate of the Lucian King for Noctis, who would set a new future for his people. Okay, there it is. There it is. The fact that we were left on episode Iden on the cliffhanger that humanity has no free will, something that is always against the moral philosophy of Final Fantasy. You know, Final Fantasy 13 was so huge with that, is while the actions you know, of bringing back the great creator who can bring forward a new era of happiness and the lightning and the gang stood against that on the premise of free will, is that humanity had to make its own choice. Even when they distilled that down in Lightning Returns, that the very essence of chaos that we all have in us, the very source of what brings pain, of what brings hurt, of what brings murder, killing and disease and famine and war even when the option for that to be taken away by a higher deity a higher being lightning returns was great at highlighting that no that is a value you cannot take from humans because the second you do they stop becoming so and you know that that's been throughout the series same with x death even kefka although kefka's just straight up nutty but even in kefka's mind even he would view the world, that is, if, if he ruled, if he was God, if everyone was like him, um, you know, that chaos rung supreme, or there was no point in life whatsoever, uh, unless it was you know, totally in bed with chaos, you know, like the Joker. So, so for those kind of villains, chaos itself is not just a part of humanity, it's what humanity should lean into. So, wow. <laughs> So Bahamut put that decision on the plate. Uh, you know, there was the bad ending where he'd actually choose Aira and he'd, he'd, he'd stab Hardin using Aira, like controlling her her visage, her form, which is dark. And based on that, I definitely see that Bahamut has a dark side of Alyssa. I don't know if it's dark or villainous. I just think this is the perspective of a god. Um, no, a god who sees themselves as above humanity, who can't, because they're of their position, their lofty height, can't see the view of humanity. This is, again, something that's been huge throughout. And it, it goes into a deeper philosophy of God as a whole. If God does exist, then what should his role be? You know, I, I personally, I, I'm not religious. Uh, the closest thing I follow is, is Daoism, and I'm very new to that. So it's philosophy. I'm, uh, it's a lifestyle I'm getting into. But even that, you know, that just means the way, the path, the natural unfolding of things. You know, should things unfold as they are? Should God allow things, you know, if you believe in it, should he allow things to unfold? But then what happens when there's loads of suffering and famine and people starving? And that obvious question of if there is a God, why would he not intervene? Well, what does intervention look like? And to what extreme do you go? And if it's the case of Bahamut, where it could be the case of saving humanity, like when there was the world wars or, or, or black deaths, you know, or any of these mass extermination events that have happened throughout history, if none of those happened, if God intervened, would overpopulation be so huge? Would we have become so much more industrialist and, and greedy and ravenous as a species that we would have wiped ourselves out ages ago without those apocalyptic events? No, so should a God that sees so much suffering on such a mass scale intervene on those kind of events? Um, but in turn, should he even create those kind of events if he knows it, it leads to the longevity of the race, if it means that life will, in the long run, get to continue and you know certain people definitely believe that certain diseases and illnesses was brought down by god 
Um, no, but then again, should God just allow free will to reign supreme? He shouldn't interfere, which then even begs the question of what the, is the point of a God in that case? And no, some people might reply to that is, well, it's to do good, to intervene when it's for the best, for when it's good. So it'd be more like a virtue and Kantian kind of ethic. But this is where I'm going to now bring in Regis. Regis, Regis, Regis. Oh, God.